Hi everybody, and welcome back to Digital VLSI Design. I'm Professor Adam Thiemann of the NX Labs at bar -Ilan University, and now we'll do the Kahoot for Lecture 3, Logic Synthesis Part 1. So today we have 10 questions for you, starting with what happens during logic synthesis. HDL code is compiled into technology-independent primitives. Boolean optimization minimizes the literals. Logic is mapped to a standard cell library and optimized. Or maybe it's the last one. All of the above. Well, let's go back to our basic synthesis flow. And the synthesis flow is shown over here, starting with syntax analysis, going to library definition, elaboration and binding, constraint definition, pre-mapping optimization, technology mapping, post-mapping optimization, and finally reporting and exporting. If we go into the um, cadence commands for this, we, we have three parts of the synthesis process itself. Syn generic, it maps to generic cells and performs additional heuristics. Then we do technology mapping with syn map. And finally, we have syn op, which iterates over the design, changes gate sizes, Boolean literatures, architectural approaches to try and meet the constraints and so forth. So let's go back to our Kahoot. What we said is HDL code is compiled into technology independent primitives. And that's the first part, syn gen. It basically, um, translates the HDL code into, you know, NAND, NOR, that type of primitive gates, but they're technology independent. They're not from a certain standard cell library. Then we apply Boolean optimization that minimizes the literals in our design. Okay, that's called pre-mapping uh, optimization. And finally, logic is mapped to a standard cell library and optimized. So we go and we take standard cells out of the library and find a mapping between our um, Boolean optimized design to the standard cell library and then we continue doing iterations of mapping um, where we're trying to usually meet some sort of timing constraints. So these are the three kind of um, main steps of synthesis. Question number two, what is not generally common for all standard cells in a library? The cell height, the cell width, the position of the voltage rails, or the active layer at the boundary, the NP and PP. Well, I know what it is. It's cell width. So let's try to understand that. And again, we'll go back to our slides. And in the slides, we had an example of the layout of a standard cell. And what we can see here is that we have this height with the, you know, the voltage rails, that's the ground and the VDD, and they're going to be really a certain width and at a certain position with a specific height between them. That's actually the site of the, uh, of the left file, the site of the standard cell library. The cell width is going to be a multiple of the site width, but it's not the same for each standard cell. Each standard cell is going to have a different width, which is going to be a different multiple of the, um, of the minimum width of the site. Okay, and then we have all kinds of other things, you know, where the wells are. For example, let's say this is the N-well or something like that. It has to be very well defined on the side, so when we put another cell next to it, you know, we have an abutment here, this well will continue. And the same thing with the N, uh, the, the N active and the P active areas and so forth. Uh, we have to make sure that we're not going to have any design rule violations when we abut a standard cell next to it. And on the contrary, we're going to continue the um, different things like the wells and so forth. Okay, so that's what a standard cell is. Remember that standard cells are usually routed entirely in M1. In some of the newer technologies, that is not uh, exactly possible, and sometimes we go up to M2. And uh, also the same could be said about some really um, complex cells. But generally, the, the, the rule is only um, make your standard cells in M1 and in poly, and that's how they've been done for many years. So going back to the Kahoot answer, cell height is constant. That is the uh, constant. The site uh, has a specific height, which is the row size. It's actually the, the um, distance between the two voltage rails, VDD and ground. So the voltage rails position is also um, very uh, constant for all uh, the standard cells in the library. Okay, the active area, a layer at the boundary. So on the left and the right side and top and bottom as well, we have to have the active area to be the same for all standard cells so that when we put another cell next to it um, an abutment will have a continuation of that layer without some sort of uh, design rule violation. So I just took the active NP and PP as an example here, but I could have said N well or so forth. The cell width, however, is not common for all of them. The cell width is going to be a multiple of the site, but it's going to be different for each standard cell in the library. Which of the following is not in a standard cell library? A NAND gate, a 
Siller's cell and Esra and Bin's cell for a level shift, while a NAND gate for sure is. Filler cells, we discussed that there are kinds of physical cells inside the hybrid. And level shifter, that's a, a power, um, a low power type of power optimization cell. SRAM bit cell? SRAM, that comes from a vendor. It's not part of the standard cell. So I'm going to choose that one. And I got that one right too. Hey, I wonder if I wrote those questions. Okay, so what cells are in a standard cell library? Combinational logic cells, NAND, NORs, inverters, and so forth. Okay, ECO cells, those are cells for fixing things uh, using metal fill or something like that. Buffers and inverters, we have a lot of buffers and inverters, including clock cells, uh, delay cells, and hmm, level shifters. And sequential cells, many, many different types of flip-flops, latches, integrated clock gating cells, scan-enabled cells, and so forth. And physical cells, fillers, tap cells, antennas, decaps, end caps, tie cells, and so forth. So um, we saw that I was correct. NAND gates, filler cells, and level shifters are in the standard cell library. SRAM bit cells, however, that's something that we're going to get um, from an SRAM compiler provided by the vendor. It's not part of the standard cell library. Question number four, what are clock cells? Cells made of a ring oscillator to make a clock signal. Cells with balanced rising and falling delays. Cells that are very fast to make the clock propagate faster. Cells with a clock input such as flip-flops and latches. So going back to the lecture, we know what it is. It's cells with balanced rising and falling delays. So the other ones are just, um, you know, uh, wrong answers that were given over there. But let's go and see uh, our definition of clock cells. So general standard cells are optimized for speed and that doesn't mean that they're balanced. So we're going to usually try to minimize the low to high and the high to low um, uh, propagation delays and that's not necessarily the balanced cell where the low to high and the high to low propagation delays are equal. Um, this is really not good for clock cells because unbalanced rising and falling delays will result in unwanted skew as we'll see in the lecture about clock tree synthesis. So we have specialized cells which are called clock cells which are designed with balanced rising and falling delays. Um, they're usually less optimal for data and so we usually have a don't use on them so we don't use them during standard synthesis. Um, usually you only want to use buffers or inverters on the clock tree. There are certain times when we're going to put other types of logic especially um, uh, clock gating cells, integrated clock gates, which look like this, and uh, we will discuss in the next lecture. Question 5. What is the Boolean function of an AOI 22 gate? Hmm. Take a look at those. Think about it. What is AOI? Okay, I think it's this. And let's go and look why. What is an AOI function? A stands for AND, O stands for OR, I stands for inverted. And what about 2, 2? It means the first stage has four inputs, a two input AND gate and another two input AND gate, which go into an, an OR gate and an inverter, or just an OR gate. So uh, by a mistake over here, I actually have that uh, uh, picture of an AOI 2.2 on this slide. So we see that there are two, two input NAND gates. That's the first A stage with the two, in, two, two input AND gates. Then the OR and NOT stage, which is the NOR over here. So this is an AOI 2.2. And so you can go back and see that this is the Boolean function. A0 and A1, um, OR, B0, and B1 and all that knotted. Okay, so that is an AOI 22 gate and that's one of the types of uh, more complex gates that you'll find in standard cell libraries. What files are in a standard cell library? Verilog behavioral models of the gate functionality, liberty, timing, power, noise models, left abstracts of the layout of the cells, or all of the above. And obviously, the answer is going to be all of the above. 
So let's go back and take a look at the types of files that we have in our standard cell library. So the first thing is going to be behavioral views. So that's a very important um, uh, type of a file. It's usually a Verilog file that basically says, you know, if this is an inverter, then the output, let's say Z, is going to be equal to not of the input, let's say A. So it's going to have a sign Z equals not A or something like that. It has a bit more um, stuff in it. But why do we need these? Well, the first reason is for simulation. So remember, our simulator is going to read in Verilog. It's not going to read in all kinds of libs and lefts and so forth. So we need to tell it what that um, standard cell that we're going to be instantiating, such as in gate level simulation, is going to do. The other thing is for logic equivalence, we're also going to be, uh, be providing the uh, Verilog behavior of that standard cell. So those are behavioral views. So it's going to be a dot .v file. Okay, then we have the physical views, which are going to be the LEF, and we discussed LEF a lot in this uh, in this lecture, and the layout, which we're, is going to enable us to provide the specific polygon uh, layout that we can send to the fab. Transistor level, we're going to have spice files, for example, um, timing and power um, and noise files, which are in liberty uh, in liberty format usually. Synopsis uses a .db, which is a compiled type of a liberty format. Um, you know, NLDM, ECSM, CCS types of files. That's for static timing analysis. Uh, power grid views, and those are needed for IR drop analysis and others such as symbols and OA libraries that we can use um, in Virtuoso. Okay, so going back to our thing, very log behavioral models that we saw that we have, liberty, timing, power, and noise models, obviously we discussed uh, um, in depth in this lecture, and left abstracts of the layout of the cells, we discussed in depth as well. Look at that, I'm on a streak over here. So we'll go over to question seven. What is not inside the left of a standard cell? Standard cell pins, poly over diffusion of transistors, blockage on used lead metal layers, the site that the cell belongs to. And the basic uh, idea of the left is it abstracts them away. We don't want to see the transistors. So the correct answer here is that poly over diffusion of transistors does not exist inside the, the left of a file. Um, the left of a standard cell. So let's look at the left again. So the left is an abstract uh, description of the layout for place and route. Okay, it contains detailed pin information. So that's really important that we have the pins over here. And you can see that we take this layout and we make the left, we have the, the, the information about the pins, where they are, and so forth, where we're allowed to connect to it. Okay, um, it only contains it does not include the front end of the line, poly, diffusion, etc. data, which is the answer that we just gave. Okay, It only contains the outline of the cell, the size and shape, the pin locations, usually on M1, on middle 1, and the blockages where we should not route through the, uh, through the cell. So if this is a type of an illustrative example of what a left looks like, here we have the, the VDD pin, the ground pin, the Y pin, the A pin, and the B pin, and maybe there would be some blockages within. So... It does have the standard cell pins. It has the blockage on the used metal layers. The site definition, remember the site is the minimum height and width where all of the cells will be the same height because that's the row um, height. Okay, And poly over diffusion of the transistors is something that we do not have, that's something we abstract away in our left. Question number eight. What is the technology left not used for? So remember there's this tech left. Is it used for defining the timing delay through the standard cell? Routing meta layers according to DRCs? Creating vias? Defining the sites to be used? Hmm. Well, defining the timing delay through a standard cell is particular for the standard cell itself. That's not something that's generic for the technology. So I'm going to choose that. And indeed, when we go and look at the tech left, the technology left, Technology left contains simplified information about the technology for use by the placer and router. Okay, so it contains layers such as metal one, metal two, what the types are. It contains a whole definition about vias. Those are a big part of the technology left file usually. Okay, um, electrical properties like the R's and the C's, design rules, antenna data, preferred routing directions, etc. It has the site, which is the X and Y grid of the library. Okay, usually we have a site that's called something like core, and that says the minimum standard cell size, what the exact height is, and what the minimum multiple of the width is. Okay, sometimes we have double height cells, so but it will be two times the um, the the height of the cell, not one and a half times or so forth. So we can sit it inside two rows. Um, some things like IOs will have a special site which is different. Okay, so we have lots of via definitions. We have some unit definitions, some grids like uh, where the tracks are and so forth for layout and for layout and routing. So that's the tech left file. 
okay? It does not have the, the timing delays through a standard cell. That's uh, what lib files have, okay? Um, it does have the routing layers according to DRCs. It has, uh, it has via creation rules, and it has the sites to be used. What parameters affect the delay of a cell in a lib file? Input transition and output load, input transition and input load, output transition and output load, output transition and input load. Well, this may be the single most important thing that we've learned up till now in this class, and one of the most important things that we're going to learn in the entire class. And of course, it's input transition. So, let's look at the model of our cell, and we'll just take the nonlinear delay model because it's the simplest and most classic one. And what we have inside is this model. This is some sort of a gate or a timing arc, and we have some sort of a, um, a rising uh, edge in this case on the input, and because this is an inverting cell, we have a falling edge on the output. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the slew of the input um, signal, and we're going to take the out, uh, the load of the output signal, and we're going to, um, based on that, we're going to get the uh, delay, the propagation delay, the TPD, and we're going to get the transition time on the slew of the output. And you can see that um, over here in one of these types of things, we have uh, these lookup table templates, which have variable one being the input net transition and variable two being the output net capacitance. And that's going to tell us what the timing delay is according to the table over here. Okay, so that is really, really, really super important. It's one of the most important things we're going to uh, use. Um, here's a more graphical representation of these two, these two uh, textual tables where we have this table that's going to have on one of the axes the output load, the other one the input transition, and here are the values, and we're going to choose what the, uh, what the propagation delay or the rise time or fall time or set up or delay time and power. Everything's going to come out of one of these types of tables. Okay, so um, our delay model is going to be based on input transition and output load, and that's a really, really important thing. It helps us, it enables us to do um, timing and power and noise estimation of the entire design. And we've reached the last question for this Kahoot. How does the synthesizer estimate the parasitics before layout? Well, this is something that drives me nuts because does it have standard delays for each type of cell? Does it guess what the delay is according to the logic? Does it base it on the previous round of place and route? Or does it use a lookup table based on the fan out of each gate? And we saw that the wire load model uses this one. It uses a lookup table based on the fan out of each gate uh, to provide us with the delay. This is what we call a wire load model, and it's inside our uh, lib. And we see that we have a table that says, you know, what the fan out is. And according to the fan out of the the um, of that net, it's going to tell us what the resistance and what the capacitance is of that net. Now that is really, really a bad estimate. It actually doesn't show us very much. So nowadays, you we often use some sort of a um, topo topographical synthesis or a physical aware synthesis, which does a uh, basic round of place and route and uh, drives that back into the synthesizer for um, estimating the parasitics on the nets and rerunning static timing analysis. So to summarize our um, Kahoot today, Robin, our virtual competitor, was in third place, Shima was in second place, and I got a perfect 10 out of 10 this time and won the code. So if you have any questions, please ask me on my YouTube channel, and uh, I'm here to answer your questions. Bye.